I've just been up on the cracks above us playing with these chocks and nuts. This is the, uh, the type of nut that's been developed in the climbing world. Um, as you can see, they're usually wedge-shaped in some respect. This, and the idea is to place them into the back recess of a cra crack, which would be wider at the back end of the crack, so that it couldn't be pulled through in such a way like this. Clip in a carabiner to the sling and run your climbing rope through it. Climbers have always used some sort of protective device. In the early 20th century, it was pitons. Um, the original pitons were mild steel, very soft steel like this one. It would um, conform to the shape of the crack. See that, the way it's bent, scored very badly. And it would work its way in and uh, would be difficult to pull out again. They're very difficult to remove, these mild steel pitons. In the late 50s and early 60s, the chromoly type of piton, this type of piton, became preferred over the soft piton. This is a very safe piton to use, but it does score the rock very badly. After pitons, in England at least, we moved to using pebbles. Climbers would find various sized pebbles along the foot of the cliffs and select four or five different sizes carried in different pockets. The anoraks of those days had four pockets on the front where you could put different sized pebbles. The, um, depending on the size of the crack, you would take the pebble, try to drop it down in the crack be at the bottom and thread a sling through it. Tie off the sling and hook a carabiner in, climbing rope, and there you had a piece of uh, protection. I have with me a few of the engineering nuts that were used in the 50s, late 50s. You can see that they're a standard engineering nut with the pitch, the thread, reamed out, filed, smoothed down so that a sling that's passed through it will not be abraded. It's used exactly the same way, really, as the pebbles we talked about, the same way as the modern nut dropped into the back of a crevice or a crack so that it's unable to be pulled out. Um, the thing that avoided is that you don't now have to thread it. It's already threaded on a sling. The story has it that these were found first used by a climber as he was walking up the Snowdon Railway. Snowdon is the highest peak in Wales and uh, it has a cog railway that goes to the summit and they're always finding pieces of equipment, machinery alongside the, the tracks that they were first used at this time. One of the earliest uses of engineering nuts was on the left-hand wall of Cenotaph Corner. This is a magnificent rock climbing area in North Wales. It's one of the the great rock problems of its time was the climb Cenotaph Corner, which is very close to this climb. At climbing you go, there's a tale you should know that'll make you both quiver and quail Of a hole in your toe where a clinker should go And it's all for the want of a nail You're a thousand high and you're nearing the sky and you can't get a grip on the shale only ten feet away there's a smashing belay and it's all for the want of a nail there's scarcely a grip for a small fingertip and a thousand foot drop if you fail there's a pumping machine where your heart should have been and it's all for the want of a on this climb, the, uh, the use of nuts demand uh, great skill and a high degree of organization. Every, every item was carefully checked and sorted before the climb began. The first 20 feet or so are quite easy and always have been climbed free. In free climbing, pitons and nuts are used only to protect the climber against a possible fall and are not used to support any part of the climber's weight. The left wall of a Cenotaph corner posed a particular problem. It was split by a single crack for 120 feet. At the start, the crack is quite wide. Artificial aids are used, and nuts up to an inch in diameter are inserted into the crack. 
as the climber moves up the wall, the crack gets progressively thin. All daylight was ended as I was descending down Finsbrook just by Upper's door. When a voice said, hey you, in the way keepers do it, the worst face that I ever saw. He said, all oh, this land is my master's. To this I stood shaking my head. For sooner than part from the mountains I love, what I think that I'd rather be dead. I'm a climber, I'm a climber from Manchester way, and I get all my pleasures the hard working way. I might be a white slave on a Monday, but I am a free man on Sunday. Oh, I've been out on Snowden, I've camped out on Croton, I've been by the Waynestones as well. Sunday on kinder, I've been burnt to a cinder, and many is the story I tell. At the time when I was climbing in the, in the mid 50s, early, late 50s rather, the, um, the use of peat on it was frowned upon, and it was very much an ethical position. I can remember no discussions of it being an ecological, of ecological concern. You know, with the Mount Rescue, for instance, we always carried peat on the name of the game was never take him out of the clip and never use him, use anything but a piton. Uh, several expedient reasons, one is they take longer to put in and longer to take out, and when you're cold and wet, and as you usually are climbing in Britain, you don't want to use pitons. So you get very crafty at using chocks and nuts. It was all, if you couldn't do it with just using protection, forget it, you know, don't do it. In the mid 50s, the left wall posed a particular problem. The crack proved too difficult to climb using free climbing techniques of those days, and it would have been unthinkable at that time to use pitons. Ron Mosley, a contemporary of Joe Brown's, solved the problem in 1956 by patiently inserting pebbles for the full length of the crack, and slowly he engineered his way to the top. Climbing on pebbles because they tended to be a little delicate, somewhat dependent on, on rock mating with rock. It, I can remember, at least on two occasions, when the pebble was a different, or apparently an incompatible material with the, with the, with the crack that it was being inserted into and just shattered, literally just ripped out and uh, sheared off. And, and I think one of the things that perhaps it did was that it made you very careful and that when you moved on, on, a, on a pebble protection, you were always uh, cognizant of the fact that, that that's exactly what it was, a pebble jammed in a crack. Close to the top of the left wall is a fairly long section when you're on it, which is which is quite thin and requires very careful, delicate placement, and must have been really a, a, a serious occasion for Mosley to be climbing on aid using pebbles for a first ascent. Even in the early 60s, when nuts were becoming very popular, the the thin part at the top of the climb was um, still very difficult to climb using nuts. And when anyone was on that climb, people would come from, from all over the vicinity to watch because they knew that there was a big likelihood that the, the climb would peel, fall off it. And then coming off that thing, you could literally hear the nuts zing out of the, out of the crack. Falling, when I was doing most of my climbing, was strictly out of order. It was considered highly inappropriate. And you'd never climb to the point where you would fall off. Though you'd come right up to that point and, and, and assess that, that if you went any further, you would. But it was not considered you know, fair game to fall. 
perhaps again because of the type of protection we were using at that time. first climbed. Some parts of it were climbed free. Most of it was aided. Since that time it has been climbed completely free using nuts. And this movement is reflected in the entire climbing world today. I have to smile when I look at the array of nuts and mechanical devices that are around us today. We are now presented with, with this paradox that, that having moved from a, a position of fairly simple, uncomplicated climbing to the massive you know, mechanical devices of the 60s, where we're, we may be moving back to a time where a simple climbing of a hard nature is a place that we have yet to arrive at. Now this is the end of my sad little song and the end of my sad little talk.